Um, so as I was saying, uh, this talk is about uh, justice for the past and accountability for the future, but I'm not actually going to speak about that specifically. I'll be touching on them throughout the presentation. And as, um, as Vanaka was saying just now, he stole my thunder because the, the first few slides are really about what the abstract says. That uh, what, what does reinvention mean and what does it mean to reinvent ourselves? Indeed, how do we reinvent ourselves with memory and plural identities in the aftermath of genocide? Do we forgive and forget or do we endlessly wait for justice, which is the theme of uh, Peter Luprich's talk this morning. So uh, I'll do this in five acts, uh, five reinventions. First, I'll talk about uh, my parents uh, who were of Chinese and, uh, ethnicity and who became Cambodian uh, in their thinking because they gave their kids Cambodian names, even though they themselves had Chinese names. Going from Cambodians to fake Vietnamese, which is the story of how we got out of the killing fields and escaped the Khmer Rouge. Going from Vietnam to France, and then from French lives to American lives, and finally from American to world citizen, which is really my story, uh, my personal story. In February 2009, I had the opportunity to give a talk at a conference called TED, which is about ideas worth spreading. And uh, it was really the opportunity to give the story of my mom's escape from Cambodia with her five children, including myself, how she uh, essentially fooled the Khmer Rouge uh, into letting her out. And uh, at that talk, I only had six minutes to tell my story. So I have a little bit more time today uh, to reflect on my families and my own re reinvention uh, in the last few decades. The talk was really special because at the end of that talk, I had the opportunity to honor my mother, who was there in the audience. And she took a, a, a bow and received a standing ovation. And the audience included my uh, wife, eight months pregnant at the time, and some very important people in the audience as well. <laughs> now, I had the feeling then that maybe, you know, my mom was 73. It might be the last trip we would make together. And little did I know how right I was, because uh, seven short months later, she passed away. And it gave me, it's given me in the period since then the, the opportunity to rethink and to, to reflect upon her legacy and this legacy of, of reinvention uh, through escape, reinvention from a married woman to a widow. Uh, she lost my father during the Khmer Rouge. Uh, she lost her firstborn, my oldest brother. Uh, he disappeared uh, in the first week. And essentially to, to, to bring that story to you now. So let's begin. Uh, act one, uh, this, this is the, the story of how uh, they were, my parents, Chinese ethnics. I mean, they were born in Cambodia, but they were of Chinese ethnicity. And they came from this part of China, southern China, Canton, Hakka, uh, to your child. They're ethnic backgrounds. So here's my mother uh, as a young woman. And this, uh, this is her background, Hokkien, uh, Cantonese opera singer here. Uh, and she grew up a pretty privileged life. She is here in Kat uh, with friends in the polka dot flower suit, a bikini suit. Uh, she's here holding a parasol, walking up the steps of Udang uh, Temple. And my father, he was of uh, Tio Chao descent. Uh, there you have good Tio Chao porridge and good uh, Tio Chao opera. And together they decided, at least as uh, Chinese of uh, Chinese ancestry, her name was Kam Yuk Lim, his name was Ir Mui Gung, to give all their children's Khmer names. So, uh, my first, uh, my oldest brother, uh, her firstborn was named Sangkum, and then her lastborn, me, uh, of course, I'm named Sopal. So we, we all uh, were given Cambodian names, and it really showed that they were beginning to accept, certainly, Cambodian nationality, even though their parents may not have uh, by giving them Chinese names. Uh, we lived in a house not far from uh, the road to the airport there in Phnom Penh in a three-story mansion. And uh, I got the chance in December to actually visit that house. It has uh, 10 families living in there, none of whom are related to us. But uh, at least it's still there and it's benefiting 10 families and not one general or an ayadam of some kind. Uh, Phnom Penh itself at that time in the 1960s was, was lovely. As uh, Elizabeth Becker was telling us, it was about as French as you could get. Cine uh, Kiririm here is showing Le Petit Prince. Um, it was, it was a wonderful time. Of course, across the world, Nixon was uh, speaking about a country called Cambodia, and he was pointing on the map to Cambodia because uh, the Viet Cong were using the Ho Chi Minh Trail to resupply their troops. 
Uh, he said at one point in 1971, there are no American combat troops in Cambodia. There are no American combat advisors in Cambodia. There will be no American combat troops or advisors in Cambodia. We will aid Cambodia. Cambodia is the Nixon doctrine in its purest form. But what did this mean? Well, we know what this meant. B-52s uh, dropped their payloads, and uh, Cambodia got more bombs than five Hiroshima's and Nagasaki's from 1968 to 1973, 65 to 73, sorry. So April 17, 1975, we've been told this story before. The Khmer Rouge come, they uh, immediately evacuate the city under the pretext of impending American bombs. My family leaves along the mass of, of uh, refugees. Two, thousand, two million Cambodians had amassed themselves in Phnom Penh at this point because they were running from, from the conflict and they were all to be evacuated, including hospital patients. So, our family ended up in Persat province after a few months. And uh, one day in late 75, circa sunset, my mother actually uh, recalls, uh, told me that uh, the Khmer Rouge commune chief called a meeting and said that Vietnamese citizens were going to uh, re re return to Cambodia. They were going, the Vietnamese government wanted them back. So she'd just come back with my father from working in the fields. And so they have this meeting, and she decides at that point that you know, to stay is to die, to leave is to die, so she might as well try to take her chances and leave. And so she tells my dad to put our names down. And it takes a few months, actually, before the process really begins. But when the process does begin, on the third day of the journey towards Vietnam, essentially, my father, who's been sick with dysentery and uh, malnutrition, dies. Uh, and in a way, it would have been, it was a kind of, blessing in disguise because he didn't speak any Vietnamese and there was really no plan for him to, uh, as to how he would convince the authorities that he was in fact Vietnamese. My mom spoke some Vietnamese because she had a nanny and friends and servants who spoke Vietnamese and she'd learned from going to the markets how to speak some street Vietnamese. So act two, uh, from Cambodians to Vietnamese, uh, to fake Vietnamese. Uh, we essentially use language as our passport, as our Vietnamese passport, and the, that's the only basis for, for passing. There were two exams. My mother, actually, her Vietnamese were so bad, she'd given all the boys' girls' names and all the girls' boys' names in Vietnamese, <laughs> which certainly would have given us away. But a nice Vietnamese lady she met, uh, Cô Tao, actually, told her this and tutored her for three days in the forest, telling her, exactly uh, teaching her Vietnamese from scratch. And she, with that help, she was able to pass the language exams, uh, one from the, Viet, uh, from the Khmer Rouge cadres and another one from the Vietnamese cadres. So uh, she's able to take me and uh, my four siblings, four surviving siblings, to Vietnam. And they deposit us in a city called Hung Nu, uh, which is in the Mekong Delta. And actually, it's not over there. I mean, it's not freedom. Uh, the Vietnamese authorities tell us seven days to find relatives to, to, to claim us. Otherwise, uh, we're off to this new economic area, which is really like Persat province under the Khmer Rouge, maybe a little bit better. We had an aunt in uh, Saigon, but the only contact info for her was in the shirt pocket of my father, who was buried with it. And so, uh, by sheer luck, at the market in Hong Nu one day, my mom bumps into a, an old friend who knows the sister of my um, aunt's husband, and sends word to her. And uh, on, this, on the final night, as we're going to be led off, he arrives by boat on a 24-hour journey, it seems, to, to bribe the guards to let us out in the middle of the night. And this is a picture from 1978 of my mother here, uh, my aunt and uncle and me, precocious me. Um, but Vietnam isn't going to be the end because my mom doesn't want us to be in a, in a communist country and so we have to get our way out of there. And the only country that still has diplomatic uh, relations with Vietnam uh, from the West is France and so how to get to France. We had a distant cousin, a starving student studying in Paris, but he didn't have the means to get us out. I mean, he just knew uh, maybe he had to run some papers and one day he bumps into a Frenchman uh, and for whatever reason, this Frenchman, Bernard Guillardel, decides to actually help us, to help our family. So again, a French citizen, a good Samaritan, he was a chain-smoking Frenchman with uh, Gitan <laughs> cigarettes. Um, and he decides, he actually finds a, uh, opens up the phone book and finds a, a woman with the same last name as my mother and convinces her somehow 
even though she doesn't want to, <laughs> to sign papers saying that she's related to my mother. Uh, and then they get lost in the mail, and then he just forges her signature. <laughs> Bernard, actually, my mom told me, uh, hopped a gate at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, and uh, uh, close of business and uh, bangs on the counter there to say that by his watch, it isn't closing time yet. He needs to get service. And this is actually a document from, from that time, a, a fiche familiale d'état civil, showing my mother, uh, my father's name, and saying uh, he was deceased in Persat province in 75. It's uh, from the uh, Office of, uh, for the Protection of uh, Refugees and Stateless Persons. So off to France we go in 78, and I grew up pretty much, I reinvent myself as a French boy. Um, uh, pretty poor uh, circumstances. We lived in Meudon. I uh, go to kindergarten without underwear. The teacher keeps sending notes back to my mother saying, <laughs> why aren't you wearing underwear? Uh, please give your son underwear. It, it turns out after a while she meets my mother. She says, you know, why aren't you responding? Well, we don't have money for underwear. And so the French community there gave us a bunch of bags full of clothes. Uh, my sister and me there. And then in 85, my aunt, uh, at the second from, uh, from the left there, is actually uh, visiting from the United States. She's, uh, she's resettled in California. Not the same one from Vietnam, but this is another sister. It's great to have lots of sisters everywhere. Uh, so she actually comes to us and says, well, you know, you've got to move to the United States. France is really no place for you. Look at you. You're thin. You're not doing well. And, and of course, the French system, you know, is, is, is you know, Europe is the bedrock of uh, the, the welfare state, but it wasn't very friendly towards refugees in 78, early 80s. Uh, she, my mother, had post-traumatic stress. She had to get, uh, she was put on all these psychotropic drugs and uh, in and out of mental institutions, and it wasn't, it wasn't pleasant. So we leave in 85 on this Pan Am ticket, uh, now defunct, um, and arrive in the United States in California and start reinvent ourselves again, French lives to American lives. And my mom ends up working in this garment factory in Oakland's Chinatown in California, above Pumpin House Restaurant, uh, making Jessica McClintock dresses, which, uh, are very expensive dresses, but she's not getting much money for it, I can assure you that. Uh, we subsist on food stamps, um, and eventually at 16 I enter Berkeley where I do my uh, bachelor's in political science and economics, returning later for a PhD. I then go to uh, Princeton after undergrad at Berkeley and become an American citizen. So I reinvent myself as an American citizen now. I had actually tried to become a Cambodian, uh, or tried to obtain a Cambodian passport in 1996, after $360 in bribe, was told no. Uh, and so what else is there but to become a US citizen, right? Um, Act five, from American to world citizen. Uh, from Princeton, I end up working at the World Bank for three years. I do this on, uh, uh, do work on Algeria. It's really to be an international bureaucrat, honestly. Uh, and I work on Algeria, West Bank and Gaza, Tunisia, and other countries. I also work on Cambodia, which becomes my passion, of course. I worked on the poverty assessment for Cambodia, the 1999 one. And then a short stint at the Asian Development Bank in the Philippines and Cambodia, working on transparency, anti-corruption measures. And then the UN Development Program, where I served as an assistant resident representative in East Timor. Now, you know, all of this was sort of motivated. Later on, I saw this quote from Mark Malik Brown. He had worked at uh, the World Bank as a vice president and at uh, UNDP as its head. And he says, there's no more noble endeavor than the fight for social and global justice and for peace and development. And it's really what motivated me to kind of give back. I mean, I'd, give, I'd, I'd received so much. In a lot of ways, I, I feel like this UN kid, except I never had the UN experience. I was a refugee, right? Um, but this, this the, this motivation really comes from the fact that the UN as an institution, of course, is there and has always uh, fought for human rights. So in 1948, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says in its preamble, all, humans are, uh, all, all human beings are born free, equal in dignity. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. Uh, but this brings up the issue of rights and responsibilities. I mean, this, the, the, yes, there are rights, but there are also responsibilities for other nation states. And it's something I teach about now as a professor, assistant professor of national security affairs at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. I have these junior officer students 
and they need to learn about the responsibility to protect, which is a, a norm that has been described earlier in our colloquium, but hasn't really been named as such. So this R2P idea is really this, this idea, this new international norm that's supposed to protect all these people from crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, uh, genocide, and so on. Uh, it's supposed to trump sovereignty. You know, countries say, you can't come through our borders because we're a country, we're a nation state. But when you're abusing your people, there should be intervention sometimes. And we know that the UN Secretary General has worked hard to do this. But of course, the UN fails. It's, a, it's an institution of, of people, and there are different motivations and rules. And we hear over and over again, uh, never again when it comes to genocide, for example. And we know, of course, that the Holocaust and during World War II claimed 11 to 17 million lives, not just Jewish lives, but Roma and homosexuals as well. And in uh, Rwanda, 800,000 to a million Tutsis, we heard this morning, uh, slaughtered and maimed. And in Bosnia, the first uh, genocide in Europe since World War II. Here in Srebrenica, uh, 8,000 8, men and boys were killed. Bosnia claimed 200,000 plus lives, I should have said. And finally, Darfur, 300,000 plus lives, where and counting, really, to date. But you don't need to look, uh, really, at all of the world. You just need to look at Asia, really. I mean, it, it's, you look at Vietnam, for example. You've got Father Lee uh, muzzled physically in, in a courtroom for screaming, down with the Communist Party, sentenced to 10 years after this scene here. Uh, you've got North Korea, uh, starvation, a daily occurrence, concentration camps, the likes of which perhaps only in Cambodia or Nazi Germany. In Burma, monks protesting, being killed and maimed. And in Tibet, certainly, let's not forget the same happening. But Cambodia is still a troubled place, as we heard from Peter Luprich this morning. Um, the police beating in 2007 of Khmer Kampuchea Kram monks. Uh, not, I mean, sometimes I show these pictures and people think it's Burma, but this is Cambodia, okay? Uh, this, this is. Uh, th these are the activities that take place in a country uh, supposedly pluralistic and democratic. Uh, there's a case in December of last year of Senkunaka, who worked for the United Nations uh, World Food Program. Here he is. He printed a blog entry from KI Media, a blogpost.com uh, website, and shared it with two colleagues at WFP and got six months in prison for that. He's still serving right now. And in the last three years, uh, the case of Bangkok Lake, uh, 20,000 people affected. Uh, this is a lake in the center of Phnom Penh. You know, you think about land grabbing as a problem in the provinces, something that's out of sight, out of mind. But Bangkok Lake is a place where I used to go to to watch and enjoy the sunset. Uh, it's, it's, it's actually an, a wonderful uh, system where when uh, the monsoons come, the rainwaters actually can go there and there's an outlet. Well. This is what's happened. So it's being filled in. And it doesn't look like it's a big deal here, while a lake being filled in. What's, what's the problem? But this is actually what's happening. Uh, mud's, uh, mud is now uh, essentially <laughs> burying homes. And these homes, which are worth 100,000 in the center of Phnom Penh, are being offered 6,000, people moving their possessions uh, at all times of day. And what you have, of course, are protests as a result of this. And the reaction isn't certainly good. Uh, the police has not been helpful, to say the least. You've got the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Last year's progress was uh, interesting. Uh, the extraordinary chambers in the course of Cambodia, which we've already heard about. Doik, of course, uh, confessed in 2009. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, we thought, great, you know, case closed, right? So 2010 July, he is found guilty, good. But, uh, and found guilty in the deaths of 12,273 people at least, and sentenced to 35 years, reduced to 19 for a time already served. So uh, appealing, and that's kind of, well, let's contrast that to Bernie Madoff. Uh, Madoff got 150 years. He killed no one, as far as I know. Uh, $65 billion in fraud, and he's not appealing. Uh, so in the light of such lack of justice, or uh, injustice, really, how do we cope with all this? Well, I want to sort of 
take the wisdom of my mother who, who in her life, in her 73 years, was Buddhist and believed that what goes around comes around, that the people who had made our family suffer so much would eventually meet their own fates and that a karmic justice would catch up to them, if not in this lifetime, then in the next when they'd be reborn cockroaches. <laughs> and in a way, she was able to forgive the fact that justice would not be rendered, perfect justice. And uh, she wasn't alive when the verdict was, was announced, and I don't think she would have been happy with it, but she would have moved on with her life as she did through all the reinventions of her life. In Buddhism, um, if we haven't forgiven, we keep creating an identity around our pain, and that's what's reborn, that's what suffers. <coughs> and I would argue that uh, 14 million Cambodians, to some measure today, are able to somehow uh, transcend the injustice of uh, what happened to them, the lack of justice, because they're able to turn to karmic justice or to believe in their belief system that, that somehow um, justice will, come, will, will be met, if not in this lifetime, then in the next. So let me close by going back to my mom, who reinvented herself time and time again to survive, and who in the process saved, of course, many lives. So she saved uh, and, and, and I want to quote here from the Talmud, which says that whoever saves a life saves the world entire. And there's a, a Chinese proverb that is pretty similar. When you save a life, you're responsible for that life. And I would say that uh, certainly she was responsible for my life. She gave birth to me, and she saved me from uh, the Khmer Rouge, and she saved my four siblings as well. And, and then we had children of our own. So uh, in other words, you know, she took us to uh, you know, Vietnam and to France and to the U.S., and, uh, of course, uh, you know, my son, who was born a month after I gave my TED talk in February, in March 2009 here, uh, is, re is responsible, she's responsible for his life uh, in that literal sense of the word, that word. That's what I said in, in the eulogy for her. And I don't know where she is now, but uh, I'm sure mom would be very proud and happy to know that uh, my daughter, who was born in March of this year, is also here because, thanks to mom, um, uh, saving our lives, uh, uh, I'm able to bring new hope into the world. Thank you.